Hello everyone and welcome back to the next interview in my Business Success Tips series. It's my really great pleasure to introduce you to a new friend of mine, a chap by the name of Derry Llewellyn Davies, and he's the strategy man. Now, that probably doesn't need much introduction and Derry himself doesn't need much introduction, so I'm going to leave it to him to do all the introducing of, of who he is and what he does very shortly. But firstly, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to, uh, to the conversation today, Derry, and thank you for talking to me. Great to be here, Adele. Great to be here. Now, I'm not going to start in the traditional way of asking you about yourself and your background. I'm going to start with a quote that I know you like or perhaps even love, and the quote is, Wealth is what you have when all the money is stripped away. And I'd like you to share with my listeners, if you would, why that quote resonates with you. Yes, we're straight into the deep end, is it? Um, you know me. I do, I do. <laughs> uh, and I think we have to put it in context, because that, that quote, I've given that quote a, a number of times, and it happened. You need to come with me for a moment onto one of the biggest mountains in the world. Um, as we'll discover, I do like my bit of adventure uh, as well as business. But this, the time of that quote, which was profound, was 2008. And the timing's quite relevant. Um, a number of people, if you were in business in 2008, you might, might have had a tough time. Um, things might have happened to you, and it certainly was with me. You know, this was when uh, the world was collapsing, the banking collapse. It was just pre the banking collapse, actually, so we didn't actually know what was going on. But I found myself on one of the highest mountains in the world, in Mount Denali, um, in Alaska, also known as Mount McKinley and just had a brutal summit bid where I nearly lost my life on the summit bid um, and found myself with one step over the mountain uh, contemplating suicide. So it was a big moment, um, but it was a big moment for realization for me because I it was when I was, I was looking over the edge with one step and that's when that quote came back to me because it was a quote an old mentor gave to me um, well over a decade before that uh, and I just flippant threw it aside, you know, because, you know, wealth is what you have when all your money is taken away. Yeah, whatever. Wealth is a shitload of money. That's what my view was at that point in life. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly I found myself in that point where wealth was stripped away because um, I was facing imminent bankruptcy when I returned from the mountain. And, and as a business person, that's my biggest fear. Uh, I didn't know a lot of my ego was attached to the money. A lot of my self-worth was attached to the money and suddenly it wasn't there anymore. And I found myself on this brutal mountain, um, having just failed on a summit bid, which I'd never failed on any summit bid before either, the irony in the timing was, is, was quite profound. Um, and that's when I realized that with money stripped away, with all of it gone, what was I? Um, and that's when I saw my daughter's face. Uh, my daughter was 18 months old at the time. And I kind of got it for the first time. You talk about the irony of the timing. I prefer to think about it as the lessons of the timing. And... and a lot of what you do today would not be, I'm guessing, if it hadn't been for that stark moment in time. Would you agree? Oh, 100%. A big part of what I talk about now in my keynotes is called pivotal moments. Um, and, I, and that was a pivotal moment right there for me. And I've had many, as we all do. Uh, the question is whether we recognize them as pivotal moments and the decisions we make in those moments. Um, and by the way, not making a decision is making a decision as well. Mm. So, you know, for me, uh, it's, I, I have a wonderful, the hindsight is a perfect science. And I look back now, and that was one of, probably one of the most pivotal moments of my life. It was the darkest moment by far. And yet it's inspired everything that's come since then. It's given me a whole frame of life. I, I appreciate life and love in a whole new way. Um, and equally, I didn't know, it's interesting, looking back at the bankruptcy and everything that the banks hadn't collapsed at that point. And so I still didn't know what it was going on. Looking back now, it was one of the most brutal times in business history. Mm -hmm. um, but so it's all it, it, rel <laughs> it's relative. It's all, it's all fine now. Um, but yes, it's those. And it's th I think it's those darkest moments that really drive us. And, and goodness me, Adele, you know enough successful people to know that that's true, that it's actually, you know, this isn't an easy peasy lemon squeezy game building businesses. It's, it's the dark times where it's actually, it's the passion and the drive and the true essence of who you are, which will get you through. Oh, and the deepest of thinking, if you're prepared to sink into those moments and sink into those lessons, because mm -hmm. those deep moments of reflection, contemplation, are what, um, in my experience anyway, um, provides the light bulb, uh, provides the next, the next phase, uh, if we don't succumb, if we Absolutely. don't give in and, and fall over the mountain. 
absolutely and i think that's where a lot of people they retreat um and this is what i'm talking about with pivotal moments uh, a lot is that it's that it's in those times where we have to advance with abandon it's at those times where we need to mean to make the cost call and it's not the easy path by the way i'm not i'm not saying it's the easy path it's far from it but it's those are the points that actually make us um and it's those points where most people will retreat um and the dreams are destroyed in those moments which is sad absolutely and then they live in what i call struggle or at best simmer rather than mm. this idea of a sizzling exciting adventure live which is what you're doing I do try <laughs> <laughs> well let's just move on then because in light of everything that's gone before for you which you've touched on and thank you for sharing that so personal such a personal story you are now known as the strategy man and I'd like you to share why that is and what is the work that you do with the clients that you work with well, most people can't pronounce Derry Ap John Llewellyn Davis. That's why I had to be called the strategy man. That's the truth. I'm being introduced <laughs> around the world. I remember being introduced in Kathmandu to Vancouver. And I don't know what came out of the introducer's mouth, but it wasn't my name. That's the <laughs> and so the strategy man's far easier, far easier. That's... Um, but the strategy man, it's, it came from a point of a lot of people knew me for a lot of different things around business. And... Um, you know, from raising capital to, you know, the sales piece and the commercial piece and the legal piece. And it's like, well, actually, no, what I'm about, I'm about the plan. Um, and, but it's the plan to the why. And that's the big shift, I think. And that's, you know, back to that pivotal moment. That's where I realized my why wasn't big enough and I was doing the wrong things. So I was building the wrong businesses. When, if you were there and you think it's all about the money and it's, and that's just your focal point, you're probably building the wrong business. Um, and that's, uh, for me, it's about the plan to the major result. Um, so strategy is everything. You know, strategy is the plan. That is the dictionary definition of strategy. It's this fancy word, which a lot of people think they need a bit of it, um, but they're not quite sure what it is. Uh, so mm -hmm. for me, um, calling myself the strategy man is almost a challenge uh, and a little bit of a um, a hook because most people think they know what it is and ironically they really don't and I've done this I've spoken to thousands of business owners around the world and I was one of the first questions I ask I get the flipboard out with a pen and go right you know what strategy what mm -hmm. is strategy and I've had a, I've had a million different answers well, you know, big corporates would see strategy as a little bit further down the, the line. You start with vision, mission, values, strategy, uh, goals, strategic goals, then strategy. But actually, you're taking it up to the very top. Am I right? Well, I'm saying strategy is the whole thing. It's the mm. whole elephant. Mm. Um, and, you know, going back to the dictionary definition, which is it's a plan for a major result. Right. Uh, so what is the plan? The plan's kind of everything. If we can be semantic, yeah, if the, the pure strategy is really, um, we'll talk about strategy in a page in a little while, I'm sure, but the pure strategy is the real planning part, it's the objectives part, it's the, it's the strategic frame. Um, but really, for me, because it's a, pl it's a plan for the major result, if you don't know the major result, then how can you have a strategy? Um, so if you don't know the purpose, values, vision, um, articulation of the company, then how can your strategy will be flawed yeah. so for me i'm looking at chunking it up particularly for the small business i think that's the big differentiator we've had a lot of conversation around this adele and mm. we're so on the same page which is you know the corporate world um and there's a lot of the mbas etc come out of the corporate world i certainly had a background in it myself what is strategy to them is different to what is strategy to the small business. But it's the same thing. It's what's the major result. The major result for corporates is you know, mergers and acquisitions and international expansion, all the big stuff, because that's major to them. When you're a billion-dollar company, then major is different. But what's major to the small business, it, it's, it might seem smaller, but it's still major to them. And so it's still strategy. Um, it's just then defining it across the spectrum and making sure that it's the right <laughs> it's the right strategy and it's the right business that they're building in the first place. Okay, so let's get honest here. You deal with SMEs, you've got the small media and the medium enterprise. Now I'm guessing that a lot of small enterprises, the very small ones, are quite challenged by the idea of strategy, even though you're chunking it up to talk about the, the vision, the purpose. Would I be right? Is there a lot of education that, mm. that needs in that small business market? Because they many businesses live hand to mouth, um, dollar to or pound to pound, dollar to dollar. Yeah, I think you know it's not, it's not so much. I wouldn't use the word challenge. It's just you write the second point, which is just not educated in mm. that. 
Um, and that's not who the hell teaches you this stuff. Mm. They, we're, we're not taught to be entrepreneurs. That's part of the problem. That's a big part of what me and you bring to the world, Adele, mm. is that people – I wish I'd been taught this a decade ago. Well, you know, sure. don't get me started on Ooh. what they should be teaching in schools. Oh, you know, well, we'll be exactly. here all day. Oh, well, <laughs> yes. We, that's a whole different interview in its own right. But it's this the thing. We're not taught this stuff. Yeah. And so we crack on in our own pursuits of business thinking we'll work it out. Um, and the truth is we won't. And the only reason I've come to the conclusion I've come to uh, and you, the – conclusions you've come to Adele is because we've worked with so many businesses uh, and it's only through that breadth do you get the clues that oh it's the same stuff over and over again um, and it is it's just I think it's really quite easy for the SME as soon as they start learning um, because they just have never been asked the right questions and they've never been framed in the right way as soon as they are the, the answers come forth pretty quickly um, if they ask the right questions in the first place uh, and if if they're given a frame and I just um, and for me that's the wonderful part of the work that we both do well and i guess because when we're talking small businesses when you ask the right questions the answers are deeply personal because it mm. is their business they don't have to think about it yeah. much much in a, in a bigger context than that so that leads us nicely then onto this concept that you've developed called the bgi strategy on a page framework would you please talk me through that Derry? Yes, it came, it came out of a, a kind of screw you moment in the corporate world, really. Um, and I came into consultancy, and I've been advising a lot of SMEs for a long, a long time now. Um, and it was always large business plans and large decks. And I kept seeing them over and over again, and I kept they just never used. Mm -hmm. So many people write these business plans for a bank, and then they throw it in a drawer. Um, and it's like, well, that's pointless. All that work and effort goes into these documents, which just don't get used. And also, what the hell do they mean anyway? I've, I've read so many business plans, like thousands, and most of them bored me to tears. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, there's got to be a better way than this. And as I started setting my own businesses, I was like, I haven't got time to write a business plan. People might re resonate with that. You know, you don't have time to sit down and write a bloody business plan, a long, boring one. So let's just get to the point. Um, and as I was, you know, I've raised a lot of capital. It's a big part of what I've done over the years. Um, and when you raise capital, certainly I got, <laughs> I got um, groomed on the venture capital circuit in Los Angeles. And uh, boy, do you have to get to the point there really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and the same in the angel world. You just got to get to the point really quickly. I'm like, well, why don't we get to the point in business plans <laughs> really quickly? Um, and this is where the, the strategy on a page methodology came from. There's other one-page methodologies out, here, out there, which I really rate. But most of them were created for the bigger, um, bigger mid-space in the corporate world. Um, and I, nothing was created for the for the small, um, and that's where I created this framework to bring everything in the business together in one place, in a live and dynamic document that actually gets executed on a month-to-month -month basis. And that's bringing you from your purpose, your vision, your values, which me and you have talked in depth about, Adele. You know, we're both totally aligned on that one. Because mm -hmm. um, you, you've got to start with that, and it's got to be in front of you all the time because that's your guiding light. But then you bring it through into strategy, you know, long term, medium term and short term. That's the plan. So we don't just have a vision. A lot of people have vision. They've got no plan in getting there. And then the belief will go. Um, but equally, you need some numbers in there because you've got to measure stuff. Otherwise, it could be just be smoke and mirrors. So the measurement needs to be in there, too, which I call business growth indicators. Um, and then finally, we bring it right the way back into the month. And that's the important trick, I think, with the pages. We actually execute on what we're saying and we track it month on month. Because if you haven't got the accountability, the alignment and the execution in place, then it's just, again, it's just a fluffy thing that you stick on your fridge and you hope. <laughs> and I'm not into hopes. I'm into plans and getting stuff, getting shit done, Adele, getting shit done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so give me an example of, of an organization that was struggling, perhaps with little in the way of, of a plan or strategy, as you define it, that you've worked with and, and that organization's transformed on, on the back of, of this approach to, to their business. I think that the transformation happens at the why, um, which it's the purpose. Um, so the purpose is the big piece for me, the five elements of business purpose. That is where it's all at, and that's where transformation truly occurs. And by the way, it can go a number – I'm going to give you an example, but it can go a number of ways at this point. Whenever people you – know, uh, you know, whether we're doing one-to-one uh, -one in live events or retreats, it's always the same. I always start with purpose, always. And at that point, one of three things happen. Um, they either do the purpose and they realize they're completely in the right business, but they just need the strategy to get it done now and execute it. Mm -hmm. um, they are kind of, they're in the right business, but they've got a load of work to do because they've realized they've built the wrong thing. 
um, and they've got to reshift and, and transform or do some change management to, to shift out or, or into a, a parallel phase or they're out of the business. It's done. They built the wrong thing. We've got to exit. Mm. Um, and I think some of the most profound shifts has been when we've come in. Uh, there's a guy who owned a load of cafes across London. And um, when we came in and did purpose, it was clear he just didn't have a passion for it. Mm. He's doing it for the money. So many people come in to business because, and I don't blame, by the way, I did it myself. So hands up on this. I came into business as an entrepreneur because there's market opportunity for me to earn money and to have the freedom I, I chose. You know, I, I wanted to be free of the corporate world. So many of us come in for that reason. And yet we forget the other two big parts, which is do we actually love this? Are we passionate about this? And, and are we adding massive service in value in what we do? And are we going to destroy our lives as a result of it, by the way? Well, the, um, big, the big thing there is that when you've got enough money, money doesn't matter so much. When you have none, it matters a lot. And that's the, exactly. that, that's an initial driver and, and that mo that creates momentum to be successful. Uh, but when you've got plenty, just a little bit more is, is marginal and it's and therefore it, it doesn't bring the, the joy that, it, that the money at the beginning brought. And, this, and that's it. I think that so many businesses will start off for the reason of, and I, by the way, I'm not against that because I think no, that, no. Uh, I just, we just got, what I'm doing is I'm raising the awareness mm. because it's like, okay, I'm fine with you knocking yourself out over the next two or three years to build that business, to give yourself the freedom and get the money. Good. But then get ready because boredom's going to set in, yeah. frustration's going to set in, and there's a whole shift coming. Let's just be ready for it because if that's the case, we might want to exit that one and move into what you truly want to do with your life. Exactly. That's um, the key. It's just and knowing that that's likely. It's just knowing. And a lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, several years into a business, they're trapped. Mm -hmm. um, and then they don't know what to do because then they're trapped. Uh, and that's where a lot of the failure comes from is that point of trap. Yeah. Um, but the best case study, I, you know, I, this guy who had all the cafes, when we did this exercise, we went back to the why. It was clear he didn't have a passion. Um, for what they were doing. They didn't have a passion for food, and they're in the cafe business. They just <laughs> really didn't give a monkeys about food. I'm like, well, you're up against Pret-a-Manger and Eat and all the rest of it who do have a passion for food, so that's a bit of a problem right there. Mm -hmm. And it's a really competitive industry as well. So, you know, long story short, we exited. Now, he didn't think so many businesses I work with don't think they can exit. They're like, oh, no, we can't sell this. There's no value in it. There usually is. You just don't know that. Um, in this case, we managed to exit uh, most of the cafes. All of them had intrinsic value and we moved him on to do a business that he wanted to do where his passion truly lay and where his skill set lay mm -hmm. um, and that's the kind of transformation I love which is getting people entrepreneurs CEOs whatever they may be in their businesses to actually step into their passion again mm -hmm. um, and I don't care that sometimes that's within their current business they're just doing the wrong role in their current business sometimes that's a completely different business and for me that's beautiful when you can get people back on their true path that's the greatest gift I can give oh and sometimes it changes Oh, oh, I know. Yeah. You know I, I was very passionate about the, ver the first business I set up back in New Zealand, and after ten years and having large um, achievements, uh, significant across credibility, money, success, you know, all the dimensions, I was bored, and, yeah. and and I had to get out. So yeah, I, and then it was it take some time to think. Well, what comes next? What am I passionate about now? Um, do you see that often that people are passionate, then the passion goes? and they've got to find something else. Yeah, absolutely, and I think um, that's certainly true for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I think with the page, this is why with strategy on a page, you know, we execute rigorously on the quarter and the month, but once a year we check back in fully and we check back in at purpose level because the purpose shifts mm -hmm. and the passion shifts. And actually, when you start to free people to understand, you know, to be do what they love to do, they don't actually know what that is. Yeah. sometimes and sometimes you have to go and do what you think you love to do to find out that's not what you love to do at all <laughs> um, and equally then and when you really get to mastery at this um, and I looked at you you definitely you've got mastery at this Adele that's what I love about you is you actually get to a point um, so most people the first step is to just you know find out parts of what you love to do and start following that and just bringing all the right people around that mm -hmm. getting people to do the stuff that you don't love to do but the true mastery is a blend of passions um, and that is so. For instance, you know, you know, I love speaking. I, I, I'm mm. speaking on the stage is hugely important to me. Equally as one-to-one -one work, my my clients. Mm. Equally as this kind of media and digital world, so I can because we can get the message way wider. Mm. But if I start doing like the last month, I've been doing a lot of keynoting, and it's got to the point like, oh, that's too much keynoting right now. You can have too much of a good thing. Mm. 
Um, and I think that's the real mastery when you start to blend the passions and truly understand the balance you need of each. Like I need a bit of adventure too, as young guest. Um, so I need that bit of adventure, my time with my family. And this is where you start to. And there's no such thing as life balance. You know, that's that's complete horseshit. Um, the things ebb and flow, and you just got to understand that ebb and flow between the business and life. Um, but equally within the business sphere, it's about that balance of the passions across the business. And it's you know you're going to have times when you're going to be pushing it in one area, and um, then it's going to come. But you've got to get that flow back. Yeah. Uh, and that for me is mastery is when you can really balance a multiple levels of passions because I don't believe we have one. Totally, totally agree. And in fact, that that leads me to wanting to talk about things outside of work. And I'm sure this strategy on a page concept is something that we can apply in our lives. And I know you do. Um, so let's talk about your recent expedition to Mount Everest and how you used your own framework to achieve what I'm guessing was a lifetime goal for you to climb Mount Everest. Yeah, I, I love, um, I use adventure as a metaphor in a lot of my business speaking because it's the same stuff. Um, you know, climbing a mountain, building a business, oh my goodness, you can just have metaphor after metaphor with that. Um, but, you know, specifically, you know, Everest was, you know, there's life and then there's certain, certain major um, objectives. Everest was a major objective, so the page is really relevant. I talk about um, the spectrum of strategy, you know, so we need a balance across sales, marketing, operations, finance, and people in all of our businesses. And most small businesses are missing two, if not three, of those functions. And they're usually cash and talent, by the way. Um, so when you come into the Everest expedition, it's the same stuff. We needed the ability of sales and marketing because we had major sponsorship drives. We were doing one of the the world record attempt for the highest black tie dinner party on the world on the North Coal. That <laughs> that was massive media exposure. That was marketing involved. They were selling to the sponsors, um, selling to the team, and, and selling back to the families because we were going to be away for two months, you know. Mm -hmm. So sales process was needed. Operations was just incredible because we were running the British expedition, so the operational was just um, dialed in like you wouldn't believe, which most businesses have got, by the way, and that's that's the, the, the synergy between this and business. You know, you need a bit of sales and marketing to just get there, and operations is kind of by default, but it was cash and talent was the big thing, because um, it's a big expensive expedition, um, Everest, but you need the best team in the world. Um, it's the same for business, you know, I assembled the best team in the world to climb my Everest, and, um, and it's the same in business. Whenever I'm talking talent, I'm talking about assembling, you've got to assemble the best people around you, whereas most small businesses are just trying to get the next person in for as cheap as they can. Um, that's like me hiring the cheapest Sherpa that's mm. never really done the mountain before. Mm. And that would be, well, that would probably end in death, yeah. mm -hmm. um, which most businesses end up in. So um, it's the same, I use the same analogy um, in, you know, when I'm doing major projects with the page as, the, as I do in life as well as I do in business. Mm, fascinating. Although I do have to um, challenge you on one bit because I got my break in business in New Zealand, my first company, by being new and hungry in an industry where I wasn't as experienced as, as others, and, but I was highly motivated and my team were too, and we were going to go all out to make sure our clients were successful, as opposed to those that have been in the industry for a very long time who were... Um, not as energetic because they were fat cats, if you like. So I hear what you say about always selecting the best, but sometimes the young and hungry, you know, they, they've got the skill, they just haven't had the experience. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. And this is about, ta you know, when I use the word talent very, yes. very purposefully. Um, in the case of Everest, you don't want to no. have a, a Sherpa that's never been on the mountain before. That's no, really no, no, I totally agree with that. Um, and, they, and by the way, they, they are there because in, the, in our team, we had a number of um, the inexperienced Sherpas and they were at base camp and going, so that was their little trial. They were learning from the main Sherpas and they were coming up high. They weren't going to go for the summit bid, but they were going to go as far as the North Col. So that's exactly, it's, that's a perfect yeah. apprenticeship. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly, um, two I see or three It's the I same see. stuff, yeah. but if you want at the senior ranks, I throw someone in a director level. No, 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 no. You want someone who kind of knows stuff. Now, I give me someone who's got, and this is where I come back to values. You know, me and you are very aligned on values mm. and um, the work that we do around values, right? Um, for me, give me somebody who's got the passion and the drive and the attitude over someone who's got the experience every day of the week. Mm. Um, and that, that's a 
junior and mid, mid and senior ranks. So it's always the, this this values piece, this attitude piece is always primary for me. And it's um, the the skill set comes. You can teach in most stuff. You can teach in most industries. Yeah. You can teach really quickly. Yeah. Uh, and I can I, I crossed industries when I came through the corporate world. And my you know my uh, the leaders chose me. I didn't have a clue about the industries I was going into, but I had the passion and the skills and and the um, the personal abilities to to step in and learn anything. Um, so I'm totally behind you on the um, choose based on attitude yeah. first. Good, excellent. Oh, we can keep talking then. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> Phew. So let's get back to small business owners who might be listening to this interview thinking, oh, I really like this, I really get it, but where do I start? You know, I want to embrace this idea of strategy on a page. What would your advice be to them? Well, for people, we've, we've open sourced the methodology. You know, we want to get this in as many people's hands as possible. So I don't know how we do this with a link or whatever, but my book is available for free. And it's, you know, but it's, we'll get that link to people. So the ebook is, and that's the place to start, um, is it's all there. So the whole page is there. And we guide you step by step through the main points. Now, that means it's accessible. Now, people can start getting the strategy on a page and they can start right there and then, and they can understand the different points and the different concepts. Uh, and that's the best place to start. Now, it, from that, you'll know one does it resonate with you two then do you want further support and then there's we have a whole heap of frameworks and um uh, to go deeper and deeper on all these different concepts so but at the the start is always just the the, the, the book is there as a gift uh, and that will guide you in and show you the simplicity but i'll also say it looks simple um but the power is in the articulation uh, I think Richard Branson's quoted a number of things around this in that um, strategy looks amazingly simple in, in hindsight. Uh, but to get to that simplicity is hard work. Um, and this, there's an elegance in anyone can write a long business plan because you can just – it's very easy to write a long business plan. It's very hard to articulate the entire thing into one page. But once you've got that, you, you've got power. Totally agree, and and I've read your book. It's you know uh, BGI strategy on a page. It's great, and you, like you say, it it is an easy read. But the challenge is in the doing of the work and the deep thinking, and that's where I think um, having someone that's removed from the business who can challenge and test and probe, i.e., one of your team or, or you know, a business coach that gets the stuff that might not be on your team, um, is really critical for small businesses uh, to get the most out of the process would you agree yeah absolutely absolutely because mm. we can write the easy answers um and, and the, the stuff that just we come up with really quickly but it's the depth of thinking um uh, the, the, the intellectual challenge that the the rigor and uh, questioning the rigor of the answers that i think is is we get the the gold and I think you know what we wanted to do is, is the book was there as open source just to get because for the business owners who have no education and, and I don't you know don't know it's just the start mm -hmm. it's that whole oh okay there's a different way um, but then you know we combine our stuff with live events there's nothing like being live sitting next to another business owner and being challenged you know one to one being challenged from the stage um, it, being challenged in mastermind groups being challenged one to one and, and the ultimate is always one to one mm -hmm. um, this is you know this is why we sit and that's why we advise who we advise Adele is that there's no there's no, and that's why I've got the mentors that advise me there's nothing quite like somebody holding you to account yeah. um, and that was my big mistake last year but I, I for the last two years we developed strategy in the cloud which is an entire um, cloud base so you, literally you can hold yourself accountable in the cloud to strategy on a page and um, my whole concept several years ago was we'll just you know self accountability total accessibility to all um, total you know the, the entrepreneurs could hold themselves accountable and we trialed it and we trialed it and we were like people just don't hold themselves accountable no it's too easy just to let things ah oh, it was like so they need a kick in the ass it's just <laughs> and so do I and it's like that's why I have the best coaches in the world working with me on all my extreme adventures because I know I've got to dial in with them on a Friday mm -hmm. so that means I do the work um, and it's it's funny that external piece I hadn't realized the power of it till I tried to make it more accessible um, and I, yeah, I, my realization is there's no there's no substitute for the one to one. Yeah, totally agree. So I know, um, you know you're really into adventure, as as we know, and and I'm really into sucking the the the, the life out of life and and having a sizzling life. But together we see so many people who aren't. They're existing. They're they, they might be successful in business, but the rest of their life is rubbish often or just average. Um, how can we use this? Um, tell me, you know, put a, put a pitch for your uh, strategy on a page to actually create the most amazing life of which business is a part. 
Well, there's, there's two different things. The main thing, strategy on a page is making sure you're building the right business. Mm. So, and we do that from a purpose level of, you know, where you're passionate about business, where you're, you know, where the service is being added in business. There's one little box there in, um, in strategy on a page, which is called lifestyle, which is, okay, before we build this business, what's the lifestyle we're seeking? And it's very simple on the page. It's very quick, um, and it's very overarching. But it's just there's a sense check to don't destroy your relationship. If you're going to destroy your relationships, your health, and yourself in the process of building this business, you might want to think twice about that. So, um, and it's usually big ones. It's usually relationships and health because it's and it's this whole time thing, which is the excuse. Um, so it starts there. Now we don't really go deeply. All we do is put a sense check in there. But um, for me, it's the same concepts and strategy on the page which we work over. We're about to launch a whole new framework for life, which is called Diamond Life Design. And that is where you take life apart. Um, and I believe, you know, I'm pretty, I'd be interested to know what your view, we haven't had this conversation, Adele, but, you know, my view is uh, great lives are architected. Um, yes. They're not an accident. A lot of people go, oh, so Terry, how do you manage to, you know, live the life you live and have the family time and have the adventures and the travel? And I say, well, because well, I carefully architect that's how well it's about clarity i call it seductive clarity it's being really clear what it is that you want in your life um as well as in your business and and then mapping out a plan to achieve that and like you say there's going to be no balance that's rubbish yeah but but working with the ebb and flow of of the work commitments the home commitments and and taking some time out to to do the big adventure like you've done or with your family but plan for the big trip taking your kids around the world if that's what you want to do but they just don't happen by accident it's it's, no. it's vis envisioned and um put up there as as, as a must do and and um and planned for. I think seductive clarity. I love that. Mm. It's that's a great phrase. Well, if it's not seductive, it's not. You're not going to care enough. And that's why it comes back to this very why and this passion. And I, and I use adventure as the metaphor here. So mm. in my personal life, adventure is in my soul. Mm. Um, and I look for people. You know, step by step, we can architect the whole of life. However, let's just start the most important piece, whatever that may be. And I believe we've all got a soul calling in our deepest part of ourselves, which is something which is, you know, it's our creative spark. It's something that we're drawn by. For me, it happens to be adventure. I wish it could, it should be meditation or something really nice and easy. I could sit here at home and do it, but no, not it's not you. for me. It's not for me. Um, but when I land this message in, you know, in my inspirational genre, when I'm keynoting just around the Everest message, it's about living a life of no regrets. Mm. And what does that truly mean? Um, and if, and it's that, it's usually something that's missing. And it's, you know, in this endeavor of business, we can be really singular um, because it's brutal. You know, certainly in the first three years of business as an entrepreneur, you just, it's head down, arse up, and you're kind of just getting a hamster wheel. And then all of life goes, the relationships go and time for yourself goes and suddenly the passion that whatever was there kind of just dwindles. We've got to get that spark back and the spark is beyond business. Um, and it's what is that spark for you? Some people it's been music, some people it is running um, or adventure, or some people it's yoga. You can get it in art or music. It's so many different ways, but it's that whole essence of if you were going to die tomorrow, what will you regret not spending more time on? Mm -hmm. And we've got to then architect towards that. Um, and I'm, you know, I. I stand up against uh, some to vision boards, etc. Now, I have a vision board. I love it, but I have a plan to attain it. Yeah. I don't just sit in front of the fridge um, and hoping that one day that will magically some fairy dust will come along and I'll be <laughs> just to be living it. You have to step forward. There's this other law of the universe called um, action. Yeah, work. You've got to step <laughs> forward. You've got to do the work. Yeah. And we've got to create and architect the lives for ourselves, which means we've got to give ourselves permission to dream and mm -hmm. and know that it's possible as well. And you know, in talking about architecting our lives, it doesn't mean there's no room for spontaneity because, you know, architect, the word architect feels quite precise. But because you're thinking about architecting your life, there's more energy, there's more excitement, and because of that, there's a lot more spontaneity in life. This is more joy. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And I use the word architect. It's just a word that I like, and it mm. sort of suits my, my kind of planning ability. Mm. But it's the, I'm talking, you know, architecting my weekends so they're clear <laughs> to spend with my children. Mm. Um, architecting Fridays to ensure that I've got my energy back and I've got my long runs. So, you know, it's, the, it's making sure that the big blocks um, 
are in place first because yeah. they're not just accidentally going to slip in somewhere along the way and sometimes we got we've got to be really clear on where we're at right now and then be clear on what we want and understand there's a big gap um but then we've got to go to work to mm -hmm. reduce that gap and put the time in place that we need and, and it's like god with businesses i can turn around in a heartbeat you know it's it's not much so so you know, so many times the same stuff it's the i just want to spend some more special time with my children mm -hmm. i want to spend some more time while i'm not fit i just like to spend some time just get, getting my health and my vitality back and as we can usually carve out three four five hours a week um and it's done and most of it's just bad planning and they've got the wrong talent around them so they're doing all the stuff they shouldn't be doing yeah. So it's so, it's so, um, it's, I wouldn't say it's easy, it's so straightforward if you're prepared to make this, the right moves, um, but it's worth it. And it's being so committed to doing it, it's, again, it comes back to that seductive clarity around what you want. That's if, a wide, if, if it absolutely. means enough, if it's seductive enough, you'll, you will sit back and make time for these things, work out how you're going to do these things. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and like you, I well, I'm not sure about you being 101, but certainly I want to be 101, sitting in my rocking chair, reflecting back after a busy day's work, because I do plan to be working part time when I'm 101. But I also want to know that in life there's no regrets. That that mm. I you know, that I look back w with joy at at the experiences I've had, the people I've been with, you know, the the moments, um, good, bad, and the ugly. That that they've all been part of life's tapestry. Absolutely, and I, and I can tell you, it's someone who's having that conversation right now with themselves. Um, it's gonna. I'll just give you an example of a decades of work. You know, I had that conversation 12 years ago with my father, um, and it was it was a moment, another pivotal moment in my life on my father's deathbed when he told me in his last days that um, he sat there, held my hand, looked into my eye, and said, "Son, I've been such a fool. I regret so much." Um, he died two days later, and he died with that regret intact. You know, mm. he um, would never to get it back. Now, that's a big part of why I do what I do today. Mm. That was the point where I went, right, I'm not going out like that. And at that point, I had to have a moment, which is a love used analogy of the rocking chair, because that's exactly the analogy I use. I sat, I, I fast forwarded, you know, several decades. So I'm, a, you know, got my grandchildren on my knee, and I realized that if I carried on the way I was going, I would be going out with a load of regret. Mm. At that point, I was very much focused on business. Um, very singular in my approach. Um, my health was, um, un, you know, undermined at that point. So was my relationships. It was not a good picture all round. Um, then I went to work. So this is where it all began, really, for me, 12 years ago, and I had that another pivotal moment. And fast. I was, oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. I, I was going to say just fast forward then to Everest this year, where clearly I looked death in the eye again in Everest this year with a big earthquake that happened on the North Face. I was right in the middle of it. So when you have that moment, when I looked death in the eye, literally at that point, I was able to look back and go, no regrets. Mm. Now that's a shift in 12 years. And that was a beautiful moment for me in Everest to know, do you know what? I played full out in all areas of my life, in business and in life, and I could go out with no regrets right now. Um, and that, but I'm telling you that because it's if someone's sitting there going, oh my God, this is, it's not a good place to be. I, if I went out right now, I'd have loads of regret. That's a good place to be. Don't get demotivated by it. Mm -hmm. That's the place to step up and understand there's a decade of work there, um, and go to work because it's it's a, when you get to that point, if you can stand on whatever your Everest is in 10 years and look back and say no regrets, that's a beautiful place to be. Oh, I totally agree. And and to your point, I did that a couple of years ago in the lead up to one of those big birthdays that you've yet to have that I've just had. <laughs> um, and I was looking back thinking, hmm, okay, I've, yeah, it's, you know, I've, I've got a good life, um, not unhappy, but actually I'm not sucking the marrow out of it as much as I want to at the moment. And in, in both business and in my personal life. And so made some major changes, some massive decisions, and, and I'm still working on that. Um, it's an iterative thing now just to, to, to refine the, the strategy. Um, and life's never been more exciting because there's so much more ahead. And I guess the point I'm making is wherever you are at life, you can be in the early stages of life or midlife or later in life, and it's never too late to rethink things and, and re-energize, re-engage with, with your life and so that you don't have the regret that you might be sitting on right now. 
Absolutely, and it's just a moment. It takes a moment to make that decision. Adele, Absolutely. it takes a moment to make that decision. And ages, when I was running across the Sahara Desert, the oldest guy that was doing it with me was 82, wow. running six marathons across the Sahara. So don't, no, don't, there's no one out there that can give me age as an excuse. That's exactly, sure. we're boundless, we're limitless <laughs> if we choose it. So I've got one last question for you. We now know that you love business, and we know you love adventure in equal measures. What's your next adventure? So I'm back into the ultra endurance. The mountains are going to take a break for a couple of years whilst Everest settles down. Um, Everest will be back at some point. Um, I haven't finished with that mountain quite yet. <laughs> um, but next year I'll be doing the Jungle Marathon, which is uh, six marathons back to back across the South American Amazon um, in six days. So we a will marathon see. a day. Marathon a day. Well, it kind of starts off half marathon, 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 and they usually throw a double marathon in halfway through. I think on this one, so just mm. to mix it up a little bit. Mm. So, um, so yes, I'm focused on that one for next year. That uh, there's a whole lot of um, strategy to be done around that. That's for sure. <laughs> I'll come and be your support crew. How about that? Deal, deal. <laughs> that that sounds like me. I like the travel side, and I'll go find <laughs> people that are being successful in other ways of life, and I'll, <laughs> I'll be able to claim it as a business trip. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, business. hope the tax one's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, it's been a true uh, delight talking to you as ever. I really appreciate the time you've, you've given to me today and to my listeners. And I'm certain, absolutely certain, that they're going to be totally inspired by the person you are and the work that you do. And I'm hoping they'll take this information, this knowledge that you've given them and apply it um, to their businesses. And I'll make sure that the link for your book, uh, BGI Strategy on a Page, is, is connected to the interview so that they can download the, the open source resource that you're kindly providing. Great stuff. A pleasure, Adele. It's lovely to talk to you. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.